the interference in Africa started with slavery. When slavery had lost its value, it graduated into colonization. And that is the context in which Berlin must be seen when the European powers sat in Berlin and divided the continent of Africa into spheres of influence. When colonization had lost its luster through a combination of certain realities and agitation from the continent, we regained our independence. But as John Henry Clark, that great African-American said, we regained independence by mimicking European governance systems. And he rightly says, no African country will ever succeed on the basis of those systems. After that, the neo-colonial project was instituted. And all of us will remember Kwame Nkrumah's book, Neo-Colonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. And he dare says, the most dangerous. We are now in a neo-colonial stage when the European powers are at their most diabolical, when the Americans are at their most diabolical, and it's not lost on me that they'll be meeting in Hiroshima next week at the G7. And how do they interfere? They interfere militarily. They ensure that you in the military are trained in Sandhurst, are trained in West Point, so they affect your mind. They interfere diplomatically sometimes through gunboat diplomacy. And that is why you see sometimes your typical European ambassador treats our heads of states in a condescending manner. They interfere through institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. They interfere by ensuring that our economic infrastructure is beholden to theirs through dollarization. They interfere through education. They interfere by influencing our processes, by lending us advisors who tell us what to do. The neo-colonial project is alive and well, and it is at its most dangerous, and we Africans must smell the coffee. If we don't, they are going to continue to interfere. How else do they interfere? through NGOs, Danida, CEDA, UK Aid, USAID. These are Trojan horses that are introduced into our countries for the purpose of influencing our processes. And they infiltrate our institutions. Right now, if you look at the African Development Bank, look at the shareholding. It's Americans, it's Germans, it's Japanese, it's the French. And the Europeans have done their bit. They also interfere through post-colonial institutions, the commonwealth of independent nations. They are not sovereign states, former French-speaking nations. These are the instruments that they interfere through. And how do we then deal with this situation? We Africans must now begin to recognize, and this was recognized as early as 1963, and the chair of the commission is here. They'll be celebrating 60 years in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And 60 years ago, on the 24th day of May, Kwame Nkrumah warned us. He said, if we are not united, they are going to interfere with us militarily. They are going to interfere with our economy. They are going to interfere with our agriculture. They are going to interfere with our health. Our duty, and I hope that when African heads of states and government meet in Addis next week, it will not be another jamboree at which pro forma speeches are read. I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa Agenda 2063, I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa continent of free trade area. I hope it will be an occasion to revitalize 
the Malabo Declaration, the Maputo Declaration, the Yamasukru Declaration. In other words, we Africans, as I conclude, we Africans must stop operating in silos. Rwanda alone will not confront them. Burundi alone will not confront them. But if we go through the regional bodies and ultimately the African Union, we may indeed succeed in putting away this bulwark. And remember, it is no longer just Europe. There is a new scramble for Africa. The Chinese are here. The Turks are here. The Qataris are here. All of them are coming back. And the military bases that you see here is telling you that if you don't behave, we are going to use force. Sometimes I wish, and I'm saying this seriously, that we too had a nuclear weapon. Because that is what Europe and America understands. I think uh, that uh, there is a sense in which uh, there are the RECs, the regional uh, organizations. East Africa is the one that I think is closest to integration. Because as I said at the very outset, we had the East African community, which as you know, uh, died in 1970, as was revived again in 1999. And, and uh, the original members, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, have subsequently, uh, after the 1999 treaty, Rwanda are now members, Burundi are members, uh, uh, South Sudan is a member, and recently we admitted the Democratic Republic of Congo. The whole idea was to create a federation. And in the year 2004, the then heads of state did appoint a committee for fast tracking. And a report was given talking about how we are going to have a common currency, a common tariff, and common services. And indeed, some of the things are already happening. It is only in the area of common currency, which we thought we'd have in 2024, I don't think we will, and then, of course, the idea of having a political federation, as I've already said, there is a committee going around. And the idea of the federation is that we remove, make sure that there is free movement of persons. And certain countries are ahead. Rwanda, for example, I think is ahead of the region in terms of offering opportunities for employment and permits. There are certain countries like Burundi which are still lagging behind. But the whole idea is that ultimately we'll have a confederation. And that confederation will be a confederation where we will have a president. In fact, under the fast tracking uh, document, all ministers in charge of East African integration ought to have moved and ought to have been operating from Arusha in, in Dar es Salaam by the year 2010. So that is moving apace. In Sadak region, where we thought South Africa would be the anchor. I don't think that that has beyond uh, the, the trade issues. The political question is one that has not come out as strongly as, as it should. And, and that is for a number of reasons. First of all, South Africa reeling from apartheid, and then Mozambique and Angola there with the Portuguese tradition. But you can see that trade is one of the major drivers. In ECOWAS, we also know that Nigeria is the anchor in that regard. They were moving towards a monetary policy. And in fact, there is an ECOWAS passport in the same way that there is an East African passport. So in a nutshell, Central Africa is problematic. The Maghreb is problematic. And that is something that we must talk. Because in the early days, and you just give me a little latitude on this, uh, Joe. In the early days, in the 1960, we had clear pan-Africanists in the Maghreb. King Hassan of Morocco hosted certain meetings in Casablanca, Morocco, Mokhtar Old Dada in Mauritania, Habib Bogiba in Tunisia, Hamed Ben Bella in Algeria, and Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. But in the recent past, we now have individuals who are undecided as to whether they want to be part of the African continent or they want to be part of the Arab. So the Maghreb is a little problematic, and Morocco, you know, at one time even left the African Union. So in a nutshell, the drive, the hunger is there, and the push is there. So personally, I'm not very worried. I think that what we ought to do is to plant this seed so that the fire keeps burning, because it is through this regional integration 
that we ultimately will have an African Union. And, and uh, easier said than done, perhaps we are too optimistic, but is optimism not the mother's milk of progress? When we were students, we were taught history of pan-African movements, so the education system actually told about us about Africa. I now know in many African countries where history is not taught. So when you stop <laughs> teaching history, uh, then you begin to see that we do not even know what is happening. And I think that one of the things that we must do is to look at our curriculum in our respective institutions of higher learning. It is only in that way that we'll begin to plant the seed of pan-Africanism and it is only in that way that we will educate our young people. Indeed, I dare say that if Africa Agenda 2063 and all these initiatives are going to gain traction, it is the younger generation that must, in a manner of speaking, be indoctrinated, and I'm using the word indoctrinated very, very deliberately, so that they can identify with this struggle for pan-Africanism. And, and I think that that is very important going forward so that for us such as this, and you remember earlier, and then I stopped when I said that I hope the meeting on the next week in the Pan-African, in, in, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, will not be just pro forma. It will be a meeting at which the heads of states and the council of ministers raise critical issues with a clear plan of action so that the secretariat has things to cascade to the people for purposes of consumption so that we can begin to see milestones as we move towards fulfilling the pan-African dream. The continent of Africa has tried several times to define herself in order to confront and engage. In the area of trade as early as 1980 under the Lagos Plan of Action, Africa took the view that in order to go forward, we must have a master plan of how we are going to have enhanced intra-African trade and intra-African engagement. Of course, the Lagos Plan of Action came a cropper and in many ways, Africa Agenda 2063 is a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action. In other words, Africa recognizes the need to define herself and to define her agenda. And I do not begrudge nations that define themselves and their agenda. Ronald Reagan once said it, and I agreed with him, that every nation does what is in her best interest. And I have no problem with that. The problem that we have is that at critical moments in African history, we have failed to seize the moment. You will remember in 1917 at the Shamparan campaign, Mahatma Gandhi told Charlie Andrews, I do not want you to participate because at this point in time, the Indians must believe that they can do it themselves. In other words, there comes a time in the history of a nation when even friends of goodwill must be told, keep aside. We want to believe that we can do it and your help must be surreptitious and subterranean if you are a person of goodwill. And the Shamparan philosophy is what we must define for ourselves. In the year 2005, the former Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair, put together 17 individuals in what was then called the, our common interest. The report on the African Commission. The Prime Minister, he was then the President of the European Union from which Britain has now left, and he was also the President of uh, the G8 at that time before the exclusion of Russia. They produced the report. Right now, when I see the Blair Institute moving around Africa, they are implementing exactly what was in that particular report, and I have a copy of it, not for the benefit of Africa, but for the benefit of the Institute. And what they have done is to sugarcoat it and camouflage it 
for the purpose of hoodwinking Africa and for the purposes of creating an environment which benefits foreign companies to the detriment of the continent of Africa. So that some of these engagements are anodynal. They simply lull us into a false sense of security. Do I blame them? No. That is why I agree that we must decolonize all learning. You, we, you know, I don't know who said it this, that, that if you have a, that the happiness of the slave is the comfort of the slave owner. And, and I'm saying that if Africa does not recognize this, then Africa will never recognize and realize our potential. The saying goes that if you behave like grass, goats will eat you. And many times we in the African continent behave like grass and we are fit for eating. And that is what I'm saying going forward in a strategic engagement such as this. It is incumbent upon the continent of Africa. And remember I said there is a new scramble, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle. There was one month in this continent when the Russian foreign minister was here, the American foreign minister for here was here, the Chinese foreign minister was here, the French president was here, the Turkish president for, was here, when, within a period of two weeks. What were they looking for? What is in their best interest? They engage little countries. They don't want to engage the East African community. They don't want to engage SADAC. They don't want to engage ECOWAS because when they are big, they are not manipulable. And when on the 14th and 15th days of last year, the African heads of states and government were summoned, and I use the word summoned very deliberately to Washington, D.C., after the president had spoken to them and given them photo ops, they were given, Africa was given 60 billion, 54 countries, 60 billion. And then the American president started engaging in bilateral agreements with Burundi, with Lesotho, with Kenya. That is what we are saying that going forward we must be conscious. And as to training our own Ngugi Wathiongo in a book, called The River Between, tells his lead character, Waiyaki, go unto him, learn what he has taught you, but bring it home and customize it for the benefit of our people. Learning is universal and defies geography, but there is wisdom in using that learning for our benefit. And very lastly, how do we distinguish the institutional conceptual West, which is diabolical, and the individual members of those countries that actually sometimes are on our side institutionalize conceptual West as articulated through government is fundamentally diabolical. Their pretension to the contrary notwithstanding. And therefore, when we engage with them, we must have our guards up. We are capable, in my view, of discerning who is better and that is the duty of our leadership. Our leadership doesn't do a good job out of it, and that is why the demand from the civil society, the demand from academia must remind leadership at all times, you are dealing, you are dining, and I'm using this as a term of art, that when you are dining with the devil, you must do so with a long spoon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Uh, I don't know that you wanted to respond to the issue of, of definition uh, yeah. earlier on, or indeed any Perhaps comments that you might have. So, let so us not drown ourselves in semantics. This is my view with due respect. First of all, let us remember that, and I always warn us Africans, if I was using my mother tongue to define interference, or using a Kiswahili word, what meaning would it carry? And sometimes we find ourselves prisoners of Portuguese, prisoners of French, prisoners of English, or any other colonial language which we have appropriated and which we now deploy in terms of engagement. 
history has demonstrated, and my good friend Kegoro said it, history has demonstrated not once, not twice, that the intentions appear to be noble in the beginning, but when they have come in like the proverbial Trojan horse, they go beyond their mandate. Show me what is happening to Libya today. Show me what is happening to the Central African Republic. Show me what is happening to Somalia today. They were all well-intentioned and see the product. A tree shall be judged by its fruit. A mango that says it is an orange is still a mango. Thank you. I'm a king. Yes, I'm a king. I think. I'm a king. I'm a king.